ibn Taym, ibn Murra, ibn Qa'ab, ibn Nu'im. His mother was Sa'ba bint Hadrami. She embraced Islam and Talha embraced Islam early. He embraced Islam very early on. From amongst the earliest of companions, he embraced Islam at an early age. The Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, sent him with Sa'id ibn Zayd before going to the Battle of Badr to spy on the convoy. So he sent him to go and spy on the convoy that was coming to Badr. He sent him with Sa'id to go and see who is coming and what kind of enemy are we facing. So he sent him with them. When it passed by them, he sent news to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam that these are who are coming. Like this is, this is what's coming. So he was sent as basically a scout. A scout to give him the information on who's coming to approach them at the Battle of Badr. In the meanwhile, when he returned to Medina, he did not know of the Prophet ﷺ's departure to Badr. When they arrived there, the Prophet ﷺ was already facing the infidels of, of the Quraysh at the Battle of Badr. So they went after the Messenger of Allah ﷺ and they met him on his return from Badr. So the battle had already taken place. The Muslims had already won and they were on their way back. And they ran into Talha ibn Ubaidullah radi Allahu an. But when he met them, he had saved for him and Zaid a share of the spoils of war. Because they had participated in the battle. So he gave them the exact same shares of the spoils of war as those who participated in the battle. So he is considered to be one of those who participated in the battle of Badr. Maybe he didn't actually have to pull out his sword and fight. But he played a pivotal role in giving information to the Prophet ﷺ of whom was coming. <clears throat> Talha radiallahu an witnessed the battle of Uhud. Uhud was basically like the, the making point of Talha ibn Ubaidullah. The battle of Uhud we know was one of the hardest and most um, difficult battles that the, the, the Prophet ﷺ and his, and his companions faced. Talha ibn Ubaidullah earned his share of Jannah on that day. On that day. He witnessed the battle of Uhud. He stirred firm on that day. When, when, when the battle of Uhud was taking place, and that's also one of the things we'd have planned to, after, after we get through these series, I'd have planned to discuss the different battles and what took place. When confusion took place amongst the Muslims, the, the archers had left their position. And Khalid ibn Walid took advantage and routed the Muslims. There were people who were spreading the message because the Prophet ﷺ had been struck. And they said he has died. There were people, there were Muslims who were just sitting down. They were literally just sitting down on the battlefield saying that there's nothing left to fight for. There's nothing left. There's nothing for us. There's no hope for us. The one who was rallying them, we know, was Musa ibn Umair, which I'm going to tell you his story one day as well, inshaAllah ta'ala. But there were a group of companions who said, no, the Prophet ﷺ is alive and he is still fighting, so rally around him. So they surrounded him. They surrounded him. And Talha ibn Ubaidullah was one of those ones that stood firm in the front, standing in front of the Prophet ﷺ, while the Meccans were saying that this is our chance, let's try to kill him. He protected him with his hand and he was injured so severely that two of his fingers were paralyzed. And that day he got between some say 24, but the more authentic narration is that he received over 70 wounds from spears and swords on that day, defending the Prophet ﷺ. The Messenger of Allah called him Talha al-Khair. He called him Talha al-Khair. Talha, the good one. On the day of Ahad, he called him Talha al-Fayyad, Talha the open-handed, Talha the one whose hands are open. On the day of the battle of that al-Ashira, he called him Talha al-Jud, mean Talha, basically uh, of generosity, Talha the one who brings generosity. On the day of Hunayn, or excuse me, that was what he called him on the day of Hunayn. He, radiallahu an, had dark skin and thick hair. His hair was neither completely curly, nor was it completely straight. He had good facial features and was thin, but he did not dye his hair. 
from his lineage, he had, and this is what you have to also understand about when you when you see all of these, the companions followed the orders and the sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, and that he said, have many children, have as many children as you can possibly have, because I want my Ummah to be the largest Ummah. So he had Muhammad known as Al-Sajjad. His uh, eldest son was known as Al-Sajjad, meaning the one who prostrates frequently. He was killed with him, his son. Muhammad, his eldest son, was killed with him on the day of the Battle of Al-Jamal. The Battle of Al-Jamal, we'll talk about one day, but it was the battle that happened at the Khalifa of uh, Ali bin Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu. And he also had Imran from Hamna bin Jahsh. He had Musa from Khawla bin Qa'aqa. He had Ya'qub who was killed in the Battle of Al-Harra. And Ismail Ishaq from Um Iban bint Utba ibn Rabi'ah. He had Zakariya, Yusuf, and Aisha from Um Khulthum. Who is Um Khulthum? If you've been listening to any of this, you know who Um Khulthum was. Who was she the daughter of? After him, Abu Bakr. He, Abu Bakr as Sadiq, married Talha ibn Ubaidullah to his daughter Umm Khutum. And she gave him Zakaria, Yusuf, and Aisha. Isa and Yahya came from Sa'ada bint Awf. Umm Ishaq, who was married to Umm Ishaq, was the daughter of Talha ibn Ubaidullah. He married her. To Hassan ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib, one of the youth of Al Jannah. So you see the close connection to these people, these great men. Like they, they really tied connections together. They loved each other for the sake of Allah. They knew the 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 honor and din and dignity of each other. May Allah be pleased with all of them. He also had Maryam from a bondswoman and Saleh, whose mother was Al Fa'ira. Abdullah ibn al-Zubayr radiallahu anhuma once said, I heard the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying that day, meaning the day of Ahad. He was saying that day, meaning the day of Ahad. Paradise became obligatory for Talha when he aided the messenger of Allah, meaning when Talha squatted so that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could climb on his back. Because they were backed in the corner during the day of Ahad. The, the, the companions were backed into a corner at the, at the foot of Mount Uhud and they started to climb upon it. Talha got down on his hands and knees so that the Prophet والسلام, while everyone stood in front of him, Talha went back and got down on his hands and knees so the Prophet والسلام, could stand on his shoulders and reach a boulder to climb on Mount Uhud. And the Prophet والسلام, said that paradise was guaranteed to Talha on that day. When he aided the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is narrated in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad. Aisha radiallahu anha said, When Abu Bakr talked about the day of Uhud, when Abu, we're talking about Abu Bakr now. When Abu Bakr would ever mention the day of Uhud, he would say, That is the day of Talha. He would say, That day was the day of Talha ibn Ubaidullah. We know the story, I'll tell you the story, if you don't know the story of, uh, of, of, of Musa ibn Umair, the, 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 the two heroes of that day was Musa ibn Umair, because Musa ibn Umair, while, the, while Talha and the other companions were protecting the Prophet wasallam, Musa ibn Umair was distracting the army. He was distracting the army, because he was given the flag on that day. He was distracting the army. And if you don't know, I'm going to give you just a short brief. We'll go through it in, 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 in shorter detail. He lost both of his arms on that day. It is said that when his one arm was chopped off that was holding the flag, he bent down and picked it up with the other one. And he kept reciting the verse of Allah that the messengers before him have died. Because he didn't know whether the Prophet ﷺ was dead or not. The word had come to him. In other word had come to him. It didn't matter. He kept reciting, the messenger of Allah has passed away before him. And he picked up the flag with the other hand. And he started fighting until they cut off that arm. And then what did he do? Did he sit down and say, I'm done. My job is to hold the flag. Allah gave me two hands. I lost both of them. So I think I'm, I'm pretty exempt from this day. No, he reached down and picked it up with his teeth. 
they were different. Their dedication to Allah was with every fiber of their being. There was no questioning. There was no question. He picked it up with his teeth and he kept fighting until he finally was martyred on that day. And then they stomped him. They beat him into the ground. They dismembered him. But when the Prophet ﷺ came down after I get teary, I don't want to talk about Musab because if you know his story, he's he's on my very short list of companions. If Allah allows me to make it to Jannah, he's on my short list. When they found, when they came down from Ahad, the Prophet ﷺ, I know we're talking about Taha, I'm just making a small divergence. There was a few people he was looking for. He was looking for his uncle, Hamza. We know what happened to Hamza. He was looking for Ja'far. He was, and then he was asking, where is Mus'ab? Mus'ab was the first person he ever sent as a delegate from himself. One of the youngest of the companions who went through so much. Made both immigrations to Abyssinia. Did, came from a life of luxury, wealth. He came from such a prestigious family and he left it all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is said about Mus'ab that the people who knew him before, when they would see him in Medina, he would come and sit to the halaq of the companions. They would cry looking at him because he was so small and thin because of his own starvation. And he was wearing the worst of clothing. And they knew who he was. This is Mus'ab. He gave up everything. And when the Prophet Sallallahu found him, there is somewhat of weak narration that said that, O oh, Mus'ab, you did not leave anything that you didn't sacrifice for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. You left nothing. You gave away your wealth. You gave away your family. You gave away your prestige. Now you gave away your arms. You gave away your life. You stomped into the ground. You didn't leave anything left. And it is said that when they went to his house, the Prophet ﷺ said, go to his house and get his belongings, right? Distribute his belongings and find his kafan. Because the difference between the companions and us is that almost all of them always possessed a shroud. Because they knew that death was real. So they would keep in their property, part of their property was what they would be buried in. They said when they brought Musaib ibn Umair's belongings, he had a bowl and a pot. That's what he made wudu with. And he had maybe three quarters of a kafir. Three quarters of it. He did not even possess enough in this world to have enough cloth to properly be buried. And it is said when they tried to bury him, they would cover his head with his kafir and his feet would stick out. If they tried from the feet, the head would stick out. So the Prophet ﷺ said, let his head be covered and then cover his feet with lemon grass. And he put him in the ground and he said that Allah subhanahu he saw that Allah had replaced the arms of Musa ibn Umair with wings. These men were different. That day belonged to Musa ibn Umair and Talha ibn Ubaidullah. Talha ibn Ubaidullah and Musa ibn Umair protected the Prophet till the last. Abu Bakr radiallahu an said, I was the first to return on the day of Ahad. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to me in Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah. If you know who Abu Ubaidah, we'll talk about him as well. Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah was the one who would eventually take over Al-Quds for the Muslims. He would take over Al-Quds and hand over the keys of it to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu arda. And he comes on later in this series. He said, when I saw Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah, he said, please go and help him. Speaking about Talha, because he had been injured so severely. We treated the Prophet wasallam wounds first. Of course, even if you went to the companions, they would have told you, go to him first. This is another thing we talk about in one of the battles where one of the women said that she was going around to help the injured. We'll talk about this later on. I'll give you the specifics. 
trying to give them water. And every time she said she would go to one, he would say, no, go give it to my brother. He needs it more. And then she would go to him and he'd say, no, go give it to my brother. He needs it more. She would go. It kept on happening until finally she ended up back at the first one and they had all died. They had all died. That is, the, that is what they understood when they heard the verse, ikhwa, it meant something to them. It meant something to them. They were different. We then found Talha in one of a hole, in one of these holes, like they were hiding in the holes of Mount Ahad. We found Talha laying in one. Abu Bakr said he had 70 something, more or less. 70 something wounds made by sores, spears, and arrows, and his fingers were cut. This is how he became paralyzed in part of, in, in part of one of his hands. So he treated his wounds and protected the Prophet on that day, and this is in the collection of Imam al Bukhari. Musa ibn Talha, this is one of the sons of Talha ibn Ubaidullah, said that my father. Talha ibn Ubaidullah said, when the Messenger of Allah returned from Ahad, when he returned from the battle of Ahad, he went straight to his masjid and he stood on the minbar. He stood on the minbar. He glorified Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and praised him. And then he recited, Min al rijalun sadaqu wa ahadullah. That there are some people, there are some believers who were true to their promise to Allah. There are some believers that were true to their promise of Allah. And some of them have received their reward. Meaning they're buried right there in Ahad. For those of you who've made Umrah or Hajj. And you've gone to Medina. You've seen Ahad. Unfortunately there are people who go and do crazy things now. So they've had to put a fence around it. But if you stand on the hill you look over. And see the Shuhada of Ahad are still there today. Their bodies are there. I, get, I remember giving a lecture. Subhanallah, there, there are certain memories that you have, you know, of traveling for 26 years that pop up from time to time. I remember taking a youth group to Umrah. This was in maybe 2010, 2011. And I was standing on one of the hills that you can stand on where you can look over and see the Shuhada of Ahad. And I was telling the story of Musab ibn Umair. And Subhanallah, that day it began raining. Began raining out of nowhere. And for those of you who spent any time in Saudi, <laughs> rain, rain is a rare event. It started raining. And I remember telling everyone there, you can look over that fence all you want. And it's funny how that there are people that go there and do crazy things, right? And I said, you can look over there all you want. Their bodies might be buried there, but their souls aren't there. Their souls are not there. The rest of us, all of us go to Baqi. The souls of the, the believers are all there, most of them. He said, but every single person in this graveyard, their souls are in green birds that are hanging off the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that are, that are resting in the lanterns that hang off the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the real story of the shuhada of Ahad. So the Prophet ﷺ recited the verse that there are some that were true to the oath of Allah and some of them have already received the reward and there are others who are waiting to receive it. So a man stood up in the masjid. A man stood up in the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ and said, Who are they? Who are these people that Allah is speaking about? Because this verse was revealed to the Prophet so This is one of the asbab al nuzul of this verse from Surah Al-Ahzab. It was revealed to the Prophet وسلم, on his way back from the battle of Ahad. And he recited it for the first time that day. So the companion stood up and said, who are these people? Sa'ad ibn Auf said, Talha entered, excuse me, uh, the Prophet وسلم, uh, saying this verse. And then Talha is saying, I walked into the masjid as this verse was being recited. He's walking in as the Prophet ﷺ is reciting this verse because, you know, he'd been wounded and treated. You can imagine the scene. He's coming in, 70 bandages on him, fingers cut, hand paralyzed. He's walking in the masjid and the Prophet ﷺ then said, O oh, inquirer, who is asking? He pointed to Talha and he said, there is one of them. 
That's one of them right there. How beautiful of a time was that to be around and to be able to see these things, to be able to see things being revealed. This is why we talk about these stories. We keep them alive so that we can try to relive these moments to understand what these people were made of. They were made of something different than you or I. And it had nothing to do with the flesh of their bodies. Their flesh was the same as our flesh. It had nothing to do with their clothes. They're made out of fabric. What was different than them than us was what was right here in their chest. Their hearts. Their hearts were different. One of the tabi'een asked one of the companions of the Prophet wasallam, When you guys won all these victories, was it because you were greater in number? Was it because you had more military might, more arms? What was it? He said, no. We were always smaller in number. We were always outnumbered. We always had less weaponry. We were always weaker from our fasting and our, you know, our, our hunger and our starvation. He said, but what we had was we had hearts that never failed us. Our hearts never failed us while the hearts of our enemies always failed them. Our hearts never failed us because a heart that is attached to Allah doesn't fail. A heart that is attached to Allah has the power that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives it. Istiqamatul janan, a heart that doesn't shake, it doesn't move, it doesn't break. While the heart of the munafiqeen and the, and, and, and the disbelievers, they're weak. And anytime they're met with real opposition, we've seen it. Look, look across the world right now. When they're met with any opposition, they run like cowards. Because that's what they are deep down inside. But the believer, he looks at death like a warm friend. Death is a welcomed reality. He knows it's coming. And he knows if he dies at the moment when Allah is pleased with him, then he's going to meet everything he's ever wanted. His whole life, the believer has only wanted one thing, to meet Allah pleased with him with Allah being pleased with him. And death is the catalyst to that. So when he sees death, it's a welcome friend. For the disbeliever, for the hypocrite, death is an enemy. For the Muslim, death is not an enemy. It's just an end to what is temporary and a beginning to what is forever. Sa'ada bint Auf said that Talha entered upon me one day and he saw that I was distressed. So he asked me, what is the matter with you? He said, this is Talha ibn Ubaidullah, by the way. This is what Talha is saying, because Talha is distressed. He's worried. He's, you can see it in his face. What Your wife normally knows your disposition, right? She knows when you're happy, when you're sad, when you're angry, she can read. She can read you like a book. She's like, what's wrong with you? He said, I'm distressed. He's like, why are you distressed? Listen to why he's distressed. <laughs> These men were just different. He said, I have increased in money. I've become wealthy. And it's bothering me. <laughs> Most of us, we'd go home and, 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 and have the biggest smile on our face, telling our wives, you know, jump online. You remember that bag you wanted? Do you remember, you remember all those things? We're buying a bigger house, bigger car. You know, this is a good day. Talha is telling his wife, I've become wealthy and it's worrying me. Bothering me. She, she's saying, I said, do not trouble yourself. Then just give it away. Don't trouble yourself. Give it in sadaqah. <laughs> how, many of our, how many of our wives would tell us that? These, these, these men and women were built different. She's saying, give it away then. If it's bothering you, give it away. So he distributed it until not a single dirham remained. Talha ibn Yahya said, I asked Talha's treasurer, he, the per person who kept Talha's money, how much did he give away? How much was it? He said it was 400,000 dirhams. 400,000 dirhams. He wouldn't sleep. He couldn't sleep because he knew that wealth was a burden. He knew that the poor would enter paradise. The Prophet wasallam said years and years, some 40 years, 70 years, different narrations before the rich. So he said, I don't, I, this is a burden to me. 40,000 dirhams. He didn't sleep till he gave it away. 
Al Hassan, radiallahu anhu wa And Hassan should know a little bit about Talha ibn Ubaidullah. Why? Just said it a minute ago. Why should he know something about Talha? Who was Talha? Al Hassan ibn Abi ibn Abi, ibn Ali. It's his father-in-law. It's his father-in-law. We should know something about him. Al Hassan stated. Talha sold an estate that he had for 700,000 uh, 700, dirhams. He sold an entire estate that he had for 700,000 dirhams. This money only stayed in his house for one night. This money that he made, 700,000 dirhams, that's a wealth. That's, that's generational wealth at that time. It stayed in his house for one night, during which he could not sleep from the dread of that money. In the morning, he had distributed every single bit of it. And this is narrated by Imam Ahmed. These men were just built different. This world mattered very little to them. Like very little. They used every bit of it to purchase the next life. We're purchasing homes. We're purchasing cars. We're purchasing all kinds of nonsense. What they were looking for is what can I purchase in the Akhir? What can I buy in the next life? What can I build in that world that I'll live forever? Talha ibn Ubaytullah was one of those people. He sold a property in the morning and he would not sleep until it was all of its sale was distributed before he could wake up in the morning. And all of this is happening. Does anybody know where all of this is happening, by the way, at this time and period in, in Islamic history? Anybody? Adam, you should know. It's your, it's your homeland. This is all happening in Iraq at the time. Because at this time, the, the capital, as I told you, the capital of the Khalifa had been moved to where? Kufa. It had been moved to Kufa at the time. This was all happening in, 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 in Baghdad. He also reported that Talha ibn Ubaidullah sold the land which he had been given by Uthman ibn Affan. Uthman ibn Affan had given Talha ibn Ubaidullah a large section of land. And Talha sold it. He sold it for 700,000 dirhams, which was carried to him. It was brought to him. When the money bearer arrived, Talha said, A man who sleeps with this in his house, unknowing what may befall him of Allah's fate, is a naive and ignorant man. He told the man bringing him the money, that any man who sleeps at night with this in his house, unaware of the fate that could befall him, not knowing if he's going to wake up in the morning and all of this is going to be left. Meaning that what? If, he's, if he dies that night, what happens to that 700,000 dirhams? It becomes inheritance. It benefits him in no way. No way does it benefit him whatsoever. So what did he do? He gives it all away. So he told the man. Throughout the night, he set the messenger to keep distributing it and sent it to the streets of Kufa and Medina. He says, send this to the people of Medina. Because Kufa had become very kind of wealthy at the time. So he said, send it to the people of Medina. And when the dog came, he had no dirham left of it. 700,000 distributed in one night. Because he knew if I wake up in the morning, if I don't wake up in the morning, this doesn't benefit me. And if I do wake up in the morning, the Prophet ﷺ had made a promise. Man, <clears throat> he had made the promise that... Um, the hadith says, that's my mind. You cannot decrease wealth by giving charity. You cannot decrease wealth by giving charity. So he knew, if I give away 700,000 tonight, Allah has already begun the process of multiplying it and returning it to me. This was their understanding of the truth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his words. Sa'ada ibn Auf, one of his wives again, said, one day, Talha, donated a hundred thousand dirham in one day but then he could not go to the masjid because i had to repair his stove basically he had spent all day long in the streets distributing a one thousand one hundred thousand dirhams but because of you know running around with bags, they didn't have you know there was no paypal and square he had bags of this money he's dragging himself through the streets he torn his stove all to pieces and he had come home and his wife had to repair it for him and it prevented him from going to the masjid this is a story his wife is telling about him. his death talha ibn ubaidullah 
was killed along with many eminent companions. We'll talk about this battle one day and its real implications. But he was killed with his oldest son, Muhammad, radiallahu anhuma, both, may Allah be pleased with both of them, in the battle of Al-Jamal. This was a battle that took place at the Khalif of uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib because of disagreements about the way that the murder of Uthman ibn Affan was handled. We'll, we'll try to dig through that and sift through the, the truths, the lies, the narratives, etc. One day, inshallah, it's a very, very deep subject and has caused great division in this ummah. But the battle of Jamal, and this was also a battle that was partaken by one of the wives of the Prophet wasallam. But if you really read the true narratives and the true stories of the way that it happened and the way that he treated her, radiallahu anha, wa you'll know the, the reality of the matter. But anyway, Talha ibn Ubaidullah and his son, his eldest son Muhammad, radiallahu an, died in this battle. And it was on Thursday, the 20th of Jumad uh, al-Akhir, in the 36th year of the Hijrah. It is said that an arrow came towards him and pierced him through the throat. The person standing next to him said an arrow pierced him. You'll, you, you'll read this in the, in the narratives. That an arrow came and pierced him in the throat. And his response was, Qadrullahi mashafa'ala. That was his response. His response in that was, It is the will of Allah who does whatever he pleases. And those would be the very last words of Talha ibn Ubaidullah. It is also said that Marwan ibn al-Hakam killed him. And he was buried in Basra at the age of 60. Some say 62, and others say 64 years of age. Talha ibn Ubaidullah, the reason why I chose him to be next after the Khalifa al-Rashidun is because of the fact that in one of the hardest days of the Muslim Ummah, the day of Ahad, Musa ibn Umair and Talha were the victors of that day. They were the victors of that day. Mus'ab protected the Prophet ﷺ by destruction, and Talha protected the Prophet ﷺ by standing right next to him and taking the, 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 the sword stabs, the spears, the wounds for him, and allowing the Prophet ﷺ to escape. And the fact that on that day, that verse, one of my one of one of the verses that strikes me very dear to the heart, where Allah says that there were some that were true to their promise. They were true to their promise. Allah confers his love for those people on that day. That some were true to their promise and they received the reward and the others are still waiting. And that man stood up and said, who are they? He pointed directly to Talha who was walking in wounded and he said, I was wearing two red garments that were covering, excuse me, two green garments that were covering me. And he pointed to him and said, oh, oh who is inquiring? Oh, questioner? There's one of them right there. This was Talha ibn Ubaidullah. These men were cut have you heard the, the statement, cut from a different cloth? Yeah, they were cut from a different cloth. When it came time to put action to words, they did it without question. Now, we have a generation of words without action. We have a generation of humans with no humanity. We're living like animals again. It's an unfortunate reality. But these men, hopefully, inshallah,